Okay, I've been a bankruptcy lawyer for almost 25 years, and I've done many thousands of cases during that time, and I've seen a lot of stuff. I thought it might be interesting to go back through some of the cases and talk about some of the wild things that have happened. Kind of like war stories from the front lines of bankruptcy. As an attorney, I have to maintain strict confidentiality with my clients, so I won't be giving any names or giving away any identifiable information about the clients, so I'll be okay there. Also, I want to point out that a lot of these war stories didn't happen to me or my clients, but were things I saw sitting in court uh, at trustee meetings, and most of these things happened to clients of other attorneys. Lastly, most people have never been to these meetings and really have no idea what happens. So I'm hoping that some of these stories will kind of demystify the process a little so that if you do wind up having to file bankruptcy at some point, it won't be as intimidating of a process. With that out of the way, I'm Scott. Let's get started. For context, this is the procedure in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Once the case is filed, the bankruptcy court assigns the case to a Chapter 7 trustee whose job it is, is to examine the debtor and administer the estate. What that means is that the trustee's job is to find and take unprotected property of the debtor and sell it to pay the creditors. Debtors who file bankruptcy are allowed to protect and keep a certain amount of value of property. The amount depends really on which state the debtor lives in. For anything that's not protected, like I said, the trustee assigned to the case is legally obligated to take the property and sell it. Debtors are required under federal law to disclose all relevant property in their bankruptcy petition and schedules, and the willful failure to properly disclose the existence of that property can lead to criminal charges being filed against the debtor, as well as the denial of their bankruptcy discharge. That's a bad outcome for sure. So, our first war story has to do with such non-disclosure of property, but I don't think it was willful this time. I think it came out as a result of the debtor's attorney not really asking the right questions before filing the case. If so, the case probably wouldn't have been filed. Now, keep in mind, this wasn't my client. Uh, I just happened to be sitting in the trustee hearing room, and it went something like this. The trustee was conducting the hearing and asking some basic questions of the married couple who filed the case. When the trustee asked if they listed all their assets, they both replied yes. Then the wife turned to the husband and asked him, wait, did you tell him about the ranch? Upon hearing that, the trustee put his pen down, looked up, and asked, uh, what ranch? Turns out the husband and a family member had been left a ranch in Colorado or something, uh, which was not disclosed, and as I recall, couldn't be protected. Pro tip, if you ever see the color drain from the face of a bankruptcy lawyer, you know some property is going to change hands. I think in this case it was an honest mistake that happened either because the debtor's attorney didn't ask the right questions or the debtors themselves didn't tell their attorney about the ranch because they may have thought it wasn't important. Now I haven't had anything that dramatic happen, but I have seen a client that would say something like, oh I didn't tell you about the car because I thought it wasn't important or that, oh, the car was paid off, so I didn't think I had to tell you about it. Fortunately, in that case, I was able to amend the paperwork and protect it. As it turns out, an innocent omission can be corrected, but a not-so-innocent omission can't be. Let's just say that you're much better off discussing these things with your attorney before anything gets filed. It's a lot easier to fix it beforehand than to try to fix it after the case is filed. Besides, that's what your attorney's getting paid for to protect you, even sometimes from yourself. At another hearing, again, not my client, the trustee asked a similar question of the debtors. Did you list all your assets? Or something to that effect. The debtor said yes, and I knew something was up when the trustee asked specifically if they owned a house. The debtors replied, no. The trustee then pulled out a picture of a house that he had gotten off of Google Street View from, I think it was in India. At that point, it was the color draining from the face of the debtor, because he knew he was caught. He chose not to disclose the existence of the house, and he lost it as a result. The trustee listed it with a local real estate broker in India, sold the house, and took the proceeds of the sale to pay the debtor's creditors. The lesson to be learned here is to always tell your bankruptcy attorney everything, even if you don't think it's important. Let the attorney figure out what's important and what's not, 
and then conduct the case accordingly. That's, again, your attorney's job. I believe it's better to over-disclose than under-disclose. The trustees I deal with know that about me, and they know that I'm not trying to hide the ball from them, and I'm not trying to pull a fast one. Now, I have had clients ask things like, well, what happens if we don't disclose something, like a car or a potential right to sue someone? And I tell them all the same thing. I like you, but I'm not putting my license on the line to help you do something you shouldn't do. And I don't think you want to be put in that position of explaining why you didn't list something in your petition and schedules. After I explain the potential consequences, almost every client agrees that yeah, non-disclosure of assets is not a good idea. And yes, I have had a client say that he was not going to disclose something no matter what, even after I explained what could happen. He didn't care, so I respectfully declined the case and suggested he call someone else. I'm not going to be involved in something like that. Sometimes we have to have what's called a come to Jesus moment in the office with clients or potential clients. The idea here is that sometimes the client needs to be brought back to reality a little bit. One example of this was a client that worked at a fast food restaurant, but they had an Escalade and they really wanted to keep it. Never mind the fact that this was 20 years ago and they only made about 1500 bucks or so a month and the payment for the Escalade was about $1,000 a month. There was no way they could continue to make the payment, plus pay the rent, food, gas, utilities, everything. I asked the client, why would you want to try to keep it when that would mean you couldn't really live? Uh, the client had said that it was the only new car they had ever bought and they couldn't imagine losing it. Ultimately, they did decide it really wasn't in their best interest to keep it and they surrendered it in the bankruptcy. Since then, the bankruptcy law has been amended to give bankruptcy judges the right to not allow a debtor to keep a vehicle if it's clearly against their best financial interest to be on the hook for a car that is either way too far upside down or the payment is just too high to justify keeping the car under the circumstances. And I get it, I understand it. If your identity is kind of wrapped up in that car, whatever, it's, it's tough. It's tough to give that up, but sometimes you just have to. This come to Jesus moment really happened a lot during the foreclosure crisis of 2008 and 2009. I had so many clients who were losing their houses as a result of the housing crash. Their monthly payments skyrocketed because they bought a house using an adjustable rate mortgage. And after the rate adjusted, the payment went so high they couldn't afford the payment anymore. On top of that, housing prices had crashed so their house wasn't worth anywhere near what they owed on it. I had probably a thousand consultations, literally, where I had to explain Explain that in the end, it was just a house, and they would have other opportunities to buy another house at market prices. I had to explain many times that I understood they have an emotional attachment to the house, but on the outside looking in, I don't have that emotional attachment, and I could see it from a financial standpoint, and that it was just not worth trying to keep the house, even if they could. It was a heartbreaking conversation that happened over and over again, probably five or six times a day, five days a week for two years. But as a lawyer, sometimes we have to be the bearer of bad news. And I think the client appreciates you being straight with him up front instead of waiting until the middle of the case to get that, oh, we got to talk phone call. Another thing we bankruptcy lawyers see a lot are clients who are police officers, firefighters, and correctional officers. First off, I want to be clear. I appreciate more than I can put into words what all of our public servants and first responders do for us. Thank you. Seriously. Having said that, we bankruptcy lawyers have a saying, and that is cops, firemen, and correctional officers are all just one jet ski away from financial ruin. That's because it's easy to overspend on things like sea dues and whatever, which of course means you need a trailer to haul them, then you need the fifth wheel to stay in, then you need the big F-250 to haul it all around. And of course, you're making payments on all this from that overtime income. Keep in mind, I've had clients that make more on overtime than they do on their regular time. And that could be a lot of money. And like I said, it's easy to adjust your lifestyle based on that higher income. I get it. But when the overtime gets cut, all of a sudden the income isn't what you're used to uh, and you can't make the payments on all that stuff. And then bankruptcy becomes a real possibility. Lastly, we have to talk about spouses and ex-spouses. We know that financial troubles are one of the most common reasons for divorce. And as you might imagine, seeing couples go through bankruptcy kind of touches on their marital problems and I get to see it all. I've had a couple sit across the desk from me and when I hand them a pen to sign something, one of them will look at the other and say, you sign it. You're the one that got us here. 
Other times, I'll have a client who wants to give back a car in their bankruptcy. The rub is that the ex-spouse still has the car and is not making the payments, so they're gonna lose the car. I've had a client say, F him, he cheated on me anyway. To close this out, I've had a trustee tell me that his favorite people are ex-spouses because they'll call him, tell him all the stuff their ex didn't list in their bankruptcy but should have, and of course that means more stuff for the trustee to take and sell to pay creditors. I hope you enjoyed this behind the scenes look at what can happen in a bankruptcy, and I hope you hit the like and subscribe buttons so you'll know when I post more videos like this. In the meantime, if you want to find out about the top five myths in bankruptcy, you can click on the next video. Thanks.